Good evening, everyone. Uh, you're welcome to this Retail Investors Webinar. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Nigerian Stock Exchange in partnership with the Money Africa and United Capital Securities Limited. We'll start in a few moments, but before we start, and uh, in order for everyone to get the best out of this webinar, I would just like to very quickly run through a few event guidelines. Please note that attendees will be required to have a good running internet connection to be a part of this webinar and will be required to have their mics on mute during this event. If, however, your connection is lost during the event, please click the link to rejoin. While we'll be using a mobile-friendly application for the webinar, attendees will be advised to join the webinar from their laptops or their desktops to ensure optimum viewing of the presentations. There will be a question and answer session during this webinar and attendees may write their comments or questions to the speakers in the public chat space at any point during the event. In asking your questions, please include your name, your location, and indicate who your question is directed at. For technical and quality purposes, please note that only the speakers will be able to use their microphones. The webinar will be recorded and attendees will be able to watch it later. A link to the recorded webinar and transcript of the recording will be shared within a few days of the webinar. At this point, I'd like to recognize the presence of a few important personalities who are joining us today. And these include the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Oscar Onyema OON, the Executive Director, Regulation Division at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mrs. Tinua De Awe, the Divisional Head, Shared Services Division at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Bola Adeko. The Divisional Head of Trading Business at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Jude Chiemeka. And the Divisional Head of Listings Business at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Olumide Bolumole. My name is Ekechi Ogwo, and I will be your compare for this webinar. Um, please also allow me to um, Start off by introducing and welcoming the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, who is going to officially get things underway. Please welcome the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Oscar Onyema O.N. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, AKT. And uh, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I would like to warmly welcome you all to this Retail Investors Webinar themed Understanding Stock Market Investing. The year 2020 will undoubtedly be remembered as one which was characterized by significant economic challenges for governments, businesses, and individuals. These challenges adversely affected the means of livelihood for many individuals, and many others saw their purchasing power eroded by inflationary trends. Visible in viable investment options were few, with interest rates on many securities falling considerably throughout the course of the year. However, in spite of this, the stock market proved to be the proverbial silver lining for many investors, having recorded a number of impressive feats during the year for this for the first time since its introduction four years ago, the NSC's market circuit breaker was activated when the NSC all share index rose beyond its set threshold of 5%. The all share index posted its largest daily gain in more than five years on a day which also witnessed investors wealth grow by over 1 trillion naira. 
the NSC All Share Index has recorded a year to date return of 27.86%. Furthermore, over 877 billion naira has been raised, has been paid, sorry, to investors in dividends this year. Analysts believe that this trend is set to continue for the foreseeable future. The stock market has continued to attract significant demand from investors for different reasons, including the need to diversify their investment portfolios, the need to take advantage of dividend earnings in a negative real interest rate environment, the desire to take on ownership stakes in different iconic companies or the search for higher returns on investments. Whatever the reason may be, <clears throat> investing in the stock market continues to offer numerous benefits for investors. In addition, innovations in technology have made investing in the Nigerian stock market more convenient, secure, are more easily accessible while at the same time offering the assurance of a well-regulated and transparent investment option. At the Nigerian Stock Exchange, we recognize that it is important that investors' ease of access to the market is accompanied by a commiserate knowledge of how the stock market works and how to take advantage of the opportunities it presents. Investors want to know how to stay clear of investment pitfalls and at the same time, stay ahead of inflation. All of these and more have formed the basis of this webinar and will be discussed during the course of this event. I would like to thank the Money Africa team and the United Capital Securities Limited for collaborating with us on this event. And I would like to encourage all our participants to pay close attention to the presentations and conversations during this webinar, as they will help you understand the stock market basics and, have, and how to mitigate your risks and maximize your returns from investing in the stock market. I wish all of you very fruitful deliberations and very uh, insightful uh, takeouts. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, CEO, for starting things off. That was the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Oscar Onyema, O-N, with a welcome address and uh, some very interesting stats on the stock market. I'm sure everyone is looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, before we move on to the next item on the agenda, I'd like to point out that we would want to make this webinar as interactive as possible. So in addition to the Q&A section, which will be coming up a little later, we also have a couple of attendee polls which will run during this webinar. I'd like to encourage everyone to participate in answering them. Um, they will help us to interact better and will also give us a better idea of your expectations from this webinar. Okay, so before we go into our first presentation of the day, which is titled The Basics of Stock Market Investing, we'll have a quick icebreaker. Um, please pay attention. This is going to be a very interesting one. So please allow me to introduce, to take us through both the icebreaker and the first presentation of the day, the CEO of Money Africa and a financial literacy expert, Olua Tosin Olasende. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And that was such a wonderful, amazing speech by Mr. Oscar Oyema. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope your day has been great. Welcome to this fantastic session. I'm really, really excited about this. So, you know, I was thinking to myself, what is the biggest financial mistake biggest investment mistake you've ever made. I want you to go first. So guys, go into the comments section and type it out and I'll be reading it out. So while I'm waiting for you to type out yours, I'll just quickly share mine. 
I think the biggest investment mistake I ever made was I wanted to invest in something that was not conventional. And because I did not fully understand it, I wanted um, a friend to be able to, you know, take part in it. Yeah. And it was not in my name. So that was like the most stupid investing mistake I've ever made. So guys, I want to hear from you. So Kingsley Aquarondu is saying that his biggest investment mistake is Forex, investing in Forex. Interesting. All right. Ima Obong and Tia is saying that her biggest mistake is not investing earlier. That's a very big one. Um, Samuel is saying that not starting on time. Guys, time is a critical element in investing. It's a very, very big advantage. Favor Okwara is saying that Ponzi has been the all-time biggest for me. Great one, Ponzi. A great one, Favor. I think the biggest, the beautiful thing about this is that being able to identify it and then making better decisions. Belima is saying that not taking enough risk. That's true. Chidema is saying that she was investing in a network marketing company. Um, oh, hold on, guys. You guys are so fast. Hold on. Tamiwa is saying that my biggest mistake is starting late and listening to discouragement. That's true, guys. Time is a big thing. Um, Chika Odili is saying that I am yet to understand the business. That's fine. You shouldn't invest in something you do not understand. I'm going to take 10 more and then I'll wrap it up. Abubaka Haruna is saying she invested in MMM. Oh my goodness, please don't do that again. Aya Roju Prince is saying that not taking risk. Balancing your portfolio is very important. Um, somebody else is saying that I sold my stock earlier. Matthias is saying that not having in-depth knowledge. Emmanuel is saying investing in stocks, interesting. Adetong is saying my biggest mistake is the fear to start. I totally understand that. I'll be addressing that today. Damola is saying my biggest mistake is not buying MTN stocks on time <laughs> and getting Forex training from a certified place. All right. Thanks for sharing. And then the last three, Ifan is saying buying junk stocks. Thank you for sharing. Mohammed is saying, I do not think I have made a mistake, but I'd say that the NSC didn't do much to help Nigerians know about what the stock market is. All right. Welcome feedback. The team is here. Um, Cyril is saying my biggest investment mistake is not diversifying my investment. That's a very good one. Diversification is very important. And the last but not the least is from Okwe Oluwa Olowe. She's saying that my biggest mistake is buying the wrong commodity. I'll just take one more, just one more bonus. Lohumola Thompson is saying being an illiteracy in investing. If you notice, there's a theme here. So time was a very big one. People were saying, oh, I did not start on time. But you know what they always say? The next best time to plant, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. So you have time and today is a good day to start. The other one that we kept saying, seeing people say is that not having enough, enough knowledge. And also they spoke a lot about fear. And then another one that really stood out was also Ponzi. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing and for making this interactive. That's really amazing. And I really love the fact that this sort of sets the pace for my session. It's going to take us approximately 25 minutes. We'll be talking about breaking down in little tiny terms the concept of investing in the stock market. So most likely all the questions you always ask about the stock market, things you've been trying to understand, things that you've been wanting to be broken down into tiny little forms. We'll be covering it today. So guys, take the ride with me and let's go. Please just give me a few minutes as I share my screen. Sorry, please hold on a minute. A few minutes, we're good to go. Sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, too soon. Okay, please just give me a few minutes. Let me sort this out. All right, so my screen will be sh great. So here we are, we're basically talking about the concept of investing and how to actually get started. So this is the basics of investing. 
So whenever you're thinking about the stock market, what comes to mind? For a lot of people, they think about risk, right? And why do they think about risk? They've either heard it from their parents, they've heard it from other people. It's quite interesting that whenever people talk about stocks, the first thing they talk about is risk. So while that is not a bad thing, we need to be able to demystify what that risk is talking about. So that way, instead of us approaching risk from a point of fear, we're approaching it from a point of knowledge because the knowledge is very, very critical. So we have here the outline for this module. What is a stock market? Market, the misconception of the stock market, why do people invest in the stock market, then let's look at the numbers. Numbers don't lie. When should I start? And the last but not the list is that you too can definitely start this. Great. So what is the stock market? The stock market basically is the shares of ownership of a corporation. So let's think of this like an apple, right? Many people want to go into the market to buy an entire apple, but you do not have to. Sometimes you can just get just a bite of it. And that's what the stock market actually offers us. It gives us the opportunity to have a bite of an apple. So for those that cannot afford to buy the entire apple or for companies that are not willing to give the entire apple, they give people opportunity to have multiple bites. So that is basically what a stock market is. It's owning a piece of that apple, a bite of that apple. Now, another thing about the stock market is that it allows for ownership of a portion of the company without taking the full possession. You know what we spoke about, about being able to have a bite instead of having the entire apple. So giving people the opportunity to be able to have ownership or be part owners. Now, another thing is that it lets take orders, vote on corporate issues, such as the board of directors, accepting takeover bid amongst others. I remember when I first started in investing, I was 24 years old, and some of the banks I was investing then used to have their meetings, their AGM in Echo Hotel. Now, this is a young investor, it's my very first time, so I wear my outfit, I go with my book and paper and go for the, for the AGMs, right? And they ask questions, so who votes in favor of this? Then people raise up their hands and things like that. So now, these are some of the things that actually happen when you invest in the stock market. Also, many corporations also give stockholders dividend payouts. We're talking about that in more detail. It's more like, oh, you know what? Thank you for actually owning a part of our company. Great. So the next thing now we'll be talking about are the misconceptions. And these misconceptions are actually very, very important. The very first one is that the stock market is very risky. But guess what, guys? Even in the midst of this risk, some shares are less risky than the others. And once we have a knowledge of risk, it's easier for us to navigate. Now, there's something Warren Buffett says a lot. He says that those that do not understand risk are those that are scared of it and paraphrasing. And that is so true because if you do not understand it, then you'll be panicking and you, do, you wouldn't know how it works. Like Mr. Oscar said earlier today, the Nigerian stock market really did an amazing job. But how would you have participated in it if you didn't understand it? I remember seeing a couple of companies trading that lows, lows that we haven't seen in such a long time. But if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't know how it works, if you don't understand valuation amongst others, things like fundamental analysis, you wouldn't be able to take a decision. So that is why having the right knowledge and getting rid of that misconception, that, oh my God, I'm just going to lose money, right? If you can change your mindset about it and rather go into it from a point of strength, go into it from a point of knowledge, it's easier to navigate. Now, the next one is that Investing in stock is equated to gambling. You know, we get it a lot. Listen, what is the difference between the stock market and gambling? It's the same thing. I get that a lot. Let me tell you why this is not true. A stock has an underlying asset. What is an underlying asset? Let me give examples. So for instance, if there's a GTB listed on the stock market, there's an underlying asset. Their business is to sell loans to people. There's a real company. There's a real board of director. There's a real activity. Let's think of something else. Let's think of Fitson. It's in healthcare business. They sell drugs amongst others. There's a real business behind it. As opposed to gambling where, oh, we will host A win, host B. What is the real asset backing it? It's literally just based on certain outcomes. So it is too risky. There's no real activity backing it. So that is the reason why you cannot say that investing in the stock market is the same thing as what gambling because stocks have real assets and real activities backing it as opposed to just outcomes oh if manchester wins chelsea oh who is your favorite um soccer player, soccer team you know or, or who else is in that space so just think about one team winning another it's it's, it's just such a limited outcome number three 
the stock market is exclusive club for brokers and rich people. And I think this is very interesting. I remember back in those days, a couple of asset management firms that will not let you invest in the stock market if you do not have up to 5 million naira. So indeed, that would look like it's like, oh my goodness, you need to have a lot of money to be able to get into that space. But thanks to technology, they're breaking through. So technology has done it in such a way that Chukuma can actually start investing with as little as 5,000 naira. Yewande can start investing with as little as 5,000 naira. Zainab can start investing with as little as 5,000 naira. So they're leveraging on technology to be able to ensure that even though people have little sums, they're able to invest. So for instance, let's say you saw a windfall and you've been eyeing a particular stock. You don't have to wait till you have a million before you take a position. You don't have to wait till you have 100,000 before you take a position. Now, it's done in such a way that even with your little, little money, you can like you know, build over time and sort of compound it. And that's what is happening there. Number four, the fourth misconception is that fallen angels will always go back up. I know a couple of people that their strategy for investing is to just look out for companies that have dropped so that they can buy it when they've dropped and they'll go back up. I hate to disappoint you. That is not always true. Now, why is it not always true? Let's look at the scenario. There are two key things that actually affect a stock. We have the macro and we have the micro. What is a macro? A macro are things that are not within your power. It affects everybody. Perfect example, COVID. COVID happened. So even if you're an almighty, proper, intelligent team, COVID whooped everybody's asset. So it did not matter whether you were really, really good at the game or not. So it's macro, meaning that it is not within your absolute power. Now, micro, micro means something that is responsibility of the company. So for instance, Johnson & Johnson, they put out a product once that they had to pick back because the chemical was causing people's body to eat. It was their fault. They had a chemical problem. They had to withdraw it. So even if you look into the local market, let's say for instance, it's the biscuit company that mistakenly pushed out biscuits that were not good enough for feeding. It's a personal problem. That problem is unique to that company. It's a micro issue. So that's basically looking at it. So where am I going with all of my long story? If that problem is unique to that company, right? If they don't manage it properly, there's no guarantee that it will come back up. So that is why we always say that falling angels will not always go back up. So if they have a problem that they do not manage properly, they might not go back up. They might always stay down. Now, the next one is that stocks that go up must come down. That's not necessarily true. There are stocks that you've seen them grow strategically over the years. Of course, the stock exchange is like this. Sometimes you might go down a bit and then go up. You know how it is, the graphs, you see how the gra graphs are. But there are those that actually grow steadily on average, on average. So you're looking at the three-year timeline, you're looking at a five-year timeline, amongst others. Now, the last one, which is a very, 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 very important one, is that a little knowledge is better than none. Yes. Now, many people just, maybe they hear a couple of things from one stockbroker and then they will just take it as the norm and they'll use it everywhere and it may not always be true. So sometimes just having a little knowledge is not necessarily a good thing, right? It could actually work to your disadvantage. And that's why we always advise that sometimes a little knowledge is better than none. So it's a myth, right? So we don't advise for little knowledge. We want you to have proper knowledge. So you're not making mistakes because you have limited information. So quick wrap up. Number one, the stock market is very risky. Number two, investing in stock equates to gambling. Number three, stock market is exclusive club for brokers and rich people. Number four, fallen angels will go back up eventually. Number five, stocks that go up must come down. Number six, a little knowledge is better than none. I want you to go into the comment section. Which of these misconceptions applies to you? Which one, one of them have you ever believed or is your story? I'd like to hear from you. Let's go to the next slide. So why do people invest in the stock market? They invest for two primary reasons. Two primary reasons. Two primary reasons. Number one, the primary reason is dividend, right? What is dividend? Dividend basically is a return on your investment, right? It's basically showing you that, listen, you've bought our share, and then this is us saying we are going to give some of this money to our shareholders. Now, let us look at this anatomy, and I want you to stay with me. When you're looking at a financial statement, please stay with me. We have three key arms, right? We have your income statement. Your income statement basically measures everything that happens. You bought things today. The driver went out. This happened. That happened. It's basically tracking all that movement in your income statement, right? Basically just showing you the flow of how things are happening. So at the very bottom, after you've had your profits, taking away all your expenses, I'm talking tax, I'm talking distribution, 
and talking customers. So just name it. Then the company gives out a portion of it to shareholders. That is what is called dividend. Now, do all companies pay dividends? No, that's not true. Why don't they? It depends from companies to company, but this is what we've seen. Now, I want you to also look at this example. If you have limited money, right, and you are trying to grow, does it not make sense that instead of you giving the limited money you have away, that you just keep putting that limited money back into the business? Exactly. So whenever you look at high growth companies, whenever you look at companies that are at their beginning stage or they're just trying to steady the work, it does not make sense for them to give dividends because they are putting the money back in order to make them stronger, right? So you see how they are companies, companies that are held there, you see them giving dividends out regularly. So you need to ask yourself, what is my priority? Do I want... Am I investing because I want an annual dividend? Or am I investing because I just want to see my shares go up steadily? Now, there are some companies that still gives you both. But for the purpose of this conversation, I'm currently on what? Dividend. So basically, that is what dividend is. You know, don't worry in the Q&A. Feel free to ask me more questions about it and how it works. Now, back in those days, before the systems got very fancy, people had to go and be calculating those things themselves. But now, thanks for software, for website, for things. Just put in the company you're looking for. So let me look for any company in my head, right? Right now, what is coming? So let's say UBA, just put in UBA shares dividend, boom, the number comes up. So you don't have to go and dig the financial statement yourself to go and find what the dividend number is. So the numbers are curated for you and you can actually what see it. So that is one of the reasons why people invest in dividend. Now, there's some, sorry, invest in shares. Now, there's something else called a dividend yield. What is a dividend yield? A dividend yield basically is trying to do this. They're trying to compare, right? They're trying to say, hmm, how is my dividend compared to the other one? Because if you're saying, for instance, I got dividend of two naira, another person got dividend of 10 naira. If you're not using a dividend yield, it will look as though the person that is getting 10 naira is getting more than you, right? So percentages are like amazing. It brings everybody at the same level. So you can compare. 5% to 6%, 10% to 12%, 13% to X percent. So percentages is like a leveler. That way you can actually see, am I better off with this company or is that other company giving a better dividend yield? Again, you do not have to be able to calculate this. You can go on the internet, put in dividend yield for X company and the number comes up. But if you are curious like me, you want to know how it's calculated, that's fine. It's your dividend, it's on the top, divided by your share price. So dividend, divided by what share price and you get your dividend yield. I hope you found this helpful. Fantastic, let's go to the next one. The next one is capital appreciation. So what is capital appreciation, guys? Comment in the comment section, let me know your thoughts. I want to hear, take a stab at it. A capital appreciation basically means that, oh, I bought a share today for five naira. After six months, it becomes 10 Naira. After another eight months, it becomes what? 15 Naira. Fantastic. The share price is growing. Can you see what's happening there? The share price is growing. I mean, that's the dream of every investor. You want to see a situation where as your share is actually growing. And that, guys, is what capital appreciation is. So what it appreciates, it increases, it grows. And that is it. So this is when there is a growth in the price of the share. Now, many people invest for capital appreciation. Many people invest for dividend yield, but what other people could also do is look for a share that actually offers both. You can actually get a combination of both. Guys, please go into the comment section. I want to know who are you, a dividend hacker or a capital appreciation hacker? What is your, what is your preference? What do you like? For me, um, I love capital appreciation, but what I've noticed is that the older people, <laughs> They don't like me saying older people, but I notice that older people actually favor dividend. It's like a rent kind of thing, like a rental income. If you also notice that it's like a rental income made that ah, on an annual basis, I'm just going to get 10%. You understand? So many, a lot of people actually like that as well. But I love, love, love capital appreciation. Cool stuff. Next. We did a... Uh, you remember when they were doing the 10 years challenge last year when people were just bringing up their old pictures and they were showing you 10 years ago? We did something similar for the stock market. We wanted to see how the stock market performed over the past 10 years. And this was what we saw. So we saw GTV. Remember that when we did this, it was on the 15th of January 2019 when the 10 years challenge was raining, right? We saw GTV. GTV did like 182%. See Stan Bank. You see Nestle. Nestle did like 670%. See Transcorp. You see Nestle, Nigerian Bureaus. 
These are just examples. We're just showing you what happened over the space of 10 years. You can take your calculator, crunch the numbers for more recent ones, look at it. I think the beautiful thing about those numbers, like the minute you start understanding it, the minute you start familiarizing yourself with it, it's become so much fun. You just want to know what's happening there. Why is it growing? Why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? And I'm very happy that the NSC is doing more and more of this. So send them your emails, send them your text messages, ask them as many questions as you want to you know. We all need to get this knowledge and we need to all be in touch and be you know, well informed about what's going on. All right, next slide. When should you start investing? Oh, we get that a lot. So same, when should I start investing? Eh, is it after I have kids? Is it when I get married? Is it when? Okay, let me tell you what we think the answer is. All right, let's see. So what they say is this, right? This is what we say you should actually do when you start investing. Number one, you have a discretionary income. Discretionary income means that after you've gotten your income, yeah, and you take out your essentials, I'm talking rent, I'm talking food, I'm talking transportation, electricity, basically all you need to survive. Once you've paid all you need to survive, but discretionary income, and hey, that is when you can start investing. So now there are a lot of people that, let's say, you know, uh, it's been a very tough year. A lot of people lost their jobs. You know, it's been a very, very tough year. And a lot of people actually do not have a discretionary income, and that's fine. But if you have one, fantastic. Go ahead, start investing. You can also diversify. Maybe put some in your savings, put some in bonds, put some in equity, put some in ETF, you understand. So you start investing when you have a discretionary income. The next one is identifying your risk appetite. Now, you need to be able to understand. Remember, the stock market has some element of risk. The market could go down. So this is not where you put your money to pay rent. Because imagine if, remember when COVID happened and the market crashed? Let's say you had put in your rent in Jan and your rent was due in April and the market did, oof, it most dived, right? When you are taking that money out, you'd have lost money because of what happened to the market. So it's not where you put an emergency fund. It's not where you put something that you need, like you want to pay rent, you want to pay children's school fees, right? It's more like a long-term kind of approach, right? So you're asking yourself, what is my risk appetite? How soon do I need that money? There's some risk element here. So you want to be able to make a smart and a wise decision. Now, number three is adopt a strategy after gaining your knowledge. So we want you to learn about the markets, learn about it. How does it work? what drives it, what makes it tick, amongst others. And once you've learned about it, then you can then choose, do I want to be a long-term investor or do I want to be a trader? I was looking at the markets recently and some companies have done like 52% in one month. My goodness, that's like really, really crazy, right? So are you a short-term investor? That is, do you trade or are you a long-term investor? So whatever you do, we want you to do it from a point of strength and from a point of knowledge. And I like to say this a lot that, you know, once you demystify something in your mind, the whole game changes. I like to share stories. I love, love, love sharing stories. So our company now is moving into technology angle and we are expert teachers, we're expert in financial literacy. And I remember telling the team, tell yourself that technology is just as easy as what we do best. And once we changed that mindset about technology, we saw that we started thriving. So it's all in the mind, right? Speak to your mind. You can get this. If you can draw your eyebrow, you can do this. If you can pair up a good outfit, you can do this. It's very, very accessible. Great. Next slide is, I'm sorry. So do you know that if you had bought um, Zenith when it was 10 hour, 50 cobalt in March, it could have been over 50% return. If you had bought Nestle at 765 Naira early in the year, it could have been 45% return. If you had bought GTB at 16 Naira, it could have been 50% return. These are just random examples. Why are we doing this? Many people are scared about the market. Many people say, oh, you know what? The Nigerian Stock Exchange, you know, it's not doing this, it's not doing that. But you just have to make a move. You have to make a position. You have to do your research. You have to understand the fundamental analysis. You have to know when it is a low, when it is a high amongst others. And when you have that knowledge, then it's easier for you to make a decision. So we just chose this. There are many other stocks on the market. There are many other stocks, you know, doing great. So guys, do not be afraid. Go there, deal with your fear, get the knowledge and ask yourself, am I a long-term player or am I a short-term? player. The next slide is okay. 
<laughs> okay, my screen is freezing. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap it up now and just talk about what next. Um, when we did the research and we wanted to see how the super wealthy invest, guess what we found out? They were investing about 33% of their income on local and global stocks, right? So I'm talking about the super wealthy, right? And if they are investing in stock market as a retail investor, shouldn't you think about, hmm, why don't we actually look at this? So at the end of the day, it still boils down on diversification, knowing that I have something for emergency. I have something in the low risk category. I have something where I'm taking risk where I get to balance all of those juggling things. And once you can balance all of these things, it's easier to then make a decision. So guys, like we said earlier on in the session, the best time to start was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. Now, what can you do? Go on the internet, start reading about this thing. What is earnings per share? What is dividends per share? How can I start? There are even some platforms that gives you opportunity to be able to, you know, try your hands on it, you know, to test, invest. Go on the NSC's website as well, learn about it. I feel like, you know, when you're hungry for something, when you really desire the knowledge in something, you had find it. And now it makes it easier. Now that there are more platforms teaching us about it, the NSC is doing a great job of disseminating information. There's cartoons, there are books, you know, there's so many things out there. And guys, it's a great, great, great time to start. So I want to round up the story by telling you you, this session by telling you a story. I found the story by the Collaborative Fund. The Collaborative Fund was telling a story about a woman. Her name is Mar Maria. She she comes from a low income household, so meaning that she she she's not rich, right? She's just an average person from a low income household. And when she died, she left about she left lots and lots of money to charity. So people were curious, how did this woman do it? What did she do in that same year? Guess what? There's another man. He had finished from Harvard Business School. He was a VP at one of um, Merrill Lynch before he quit to do his own personal thing. And in that same year, he was filing for foreclosure. And they were like, ah, what's going on? This woman here from a low income household, she invested consistently. This other man here struggling, going for a foreclosure. When they started investigating, guess what happened, guys? The other woman was investing steadily on a monthly, regular basis. She was treating her investment like groceries. You know how you eat every month? You know how you buy provisions every month? So do your own budget. What is it for you? And then just invest on a gradual basis. While the other person was living in a, in a huge mansion, taking up a lot of debt, I was not able to manage it, and then they were taking it all back from him. So at the end of the day, it still boils down to habit. It boils down to knowledge. It boils down to consistency. So being able to do it what consistently over a long period of time. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope you found this impactful, and I'm very, very excited to be here. Thank you. All right, over to you. Thank you very much, Tosin, for that icebreaker and for the excellent presentation on the basics of stock markets investing. Very impressive the way you were able to break that down to the simplest terms. And uh, I can already see a few questions coming through for you, but we'll get, that, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, as I said earlier, this webinar is an interactive one, and uh, it is time now for our first of two attendee polls. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to please take a minute to answer them. Um, as they will help us to get a better understanding of your expectations from this webinar. So um, the, the attendee poll is going to be on your screen any minute from now. So please go ahead and answer them. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Please keep them coming. Um, those results are going to be analyzed and they will be displayed for everyone in, uh, in just a few moments. So please keep answering the questions. Thanks.
Okay, um, we should start rounding up with, uh, with the polls. Uh, just a few more minutes. We have uh, two minutes, about two minutes left to, to tidy up the polls so that we can, um, we can analyze the answers and share them with everyone while we go on. Um, we have 76% of people voting. I'd like to ask the others who aren't voting to please vote. Um, so as I said earlier, it's gonna help us to get a better understanding of your expectations from this webinar. In about a minute from now, this poll should be over and uh, you will be able to see the results from the poll and um, also help you to analyze this information a little bit better. So um, in about 60 seconds or thereabout, this should be over. Uh, let me remind everyone, um, you will agree with me that Tosin's presentation was a very nice and uh, insightful one. If you have any questions for her, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A section on your screens. And we will get to that during the Q&A session of this event. So please go ahead and type your questions. Um, before then, let me also state now, I can see a few people are asking that will they get the presentation slides? Yes, you will get the presentation slides at the end of the event. And you will also get a link to watch the event at the end of the day. Uh, we have a few more seconds on the poll. Um, this is going to close in a few in a few seconds, and then we'll we will all see the answers to the poll. Thanks. So the poll ends in three, two, one second. Uh, that's the end of the poll. Um, we are gonna see the results of the poll right now before we move on to the next item on our agenda. So uh, just a few seconds while the, while the results of the poll are being uh, analyzed and put together and you'll see them now. I hope everyone can, uh, can see the results of the poll. So thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in that poll. Um, I think we can go on to the next item on our agenda right now. And this is gonna be another very interesting presentation. And this one is titled, The Role of Stock Exchanges in and Financial Intermediaries in the Stock Markets. And this is going to be presented by the head of the Broker Dealer Regulation Department of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Femi Shobanjo. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Akechi, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen very quickly. Okay, all right, so my job is really essentially to give uh, a brief overview in the next 15 minutes or so about the role of stock exchanges and financial intermediaries uh, in the stock market. Uh, this is the uh, uh, framework we'll follow. We'll first talk about uh, some of the key participants in the market, uh, briefly go into the role of the exchange itself, and of course, the role of financial intermediaries in the market. Uh, we can't talk. We can't finish without, of course, mentioning the role of uh, the critical role of regulation in the stock market, and we'll leave you with some useful uh, information and links uh, that you can follow through. Uh, kicking off, uh, we'll talk about the mission of the exchange and our vision. Obviously, the mission is uh, to provide investors and businesses a reliable, efficient, and an adaptable exchange hub in Africa to save and access capital. Our vision is to become Africa's uh, preferred exchange hub. Um, and so this slide here uh, gives you a very brief uh, a snapshot of the entire 
Nigerian capital market ecosystem, uh, the various financial participants that you find in the market. Uh, and of course, chief among them is the investors yourselves, the folks who actually originate orders. Without investors, obviously we can have no market. But um, besides investors, there are various roles, various participants that make the market uh, go round as it were. Uh, we'll talk, there's another slide for broker dealers. Uh, so I won't talk too much about that, but we'll talk briefly about SEC. The Securities and Exchange Commission uh, is the apex capital market regulator in Nigeria. Uh, they maintain primary oversight of the capital market itself. They provide the enabling framework. Uh, and of course, uh, the Investments and Securities Act of 2007 is the primary legislation uh, that governs the market. Uh, the exchange, as you know, uh, is, the, is a self-regulatory organization. Uh, we have another slide where we'll talk deeply about the exchange. We also have issuers. Uh, these are the critical stakeholders who come to the market to raise funds and to raise capital. And they come in various categories. They could be uh, companies. Uh, sometimes you're dealing with uh, government uh, uh, agencies, uh, amongst others. Uh, then you have the Central Securities Clearing System, CSCS. They serve as the uh, central securities depository for the market. They ensure that clearing and settlement uh, uh, occurs uh, in the stock market. You have registrars who maintain uh, the register of company sh uh, shareholders. So uh, all the company records, all the shareholder information is maintained uh, uh, by registrars. Uh, and then you have other critical participants, uh, issuing houses who serve as investment banks, uh, OTC markets, uh, fund managers, who we would also talk about in a bit more detail. And then the trustees and custodians who essentially maintain assets uh, on behalf of investors. So what, what you ask yourself, and we're talking to a large group of millennials here, we've seen from the poll that we just took, where majority of us in, the, in, in this webinar are, are millennials. So what is the role of the stock market? And why should we really be coming to the stock market? So the stock market plays uh, a number of critical roles in any economy. Um, but we'll talk briefly about three of these major points. The first one is the primary market. And we provide, the stock market provides a primary market for the issuance of securities uh, and products uh, through which institutions uh, are able to raise capital in an organized manner uh, and investors can raise long-term wealth. Um, that's really the role of, of uh, the primary market, essentially making sure you have an efficient market where people can come in, raise capital quickly and efficiently uh, and make the entire uh, uh, you know, capital market system uh, perform its role. Uh, the secondary market, on the other hand, is a role where the, the uh, where capital is raised, uh, securities are listed on the exchange. The secondary market is where you, you perform uh, trading of those securities. In other words, the buying and the selling uh, of those securities. And it has to be done in a way that's very efficient, it's, it's transparent, and also gives confidence to, uh, to various stakeholders, including investors. And of course, all these uh, processes have to be dealt with in a very fair and orderly manner. So in other words, it has to be a very reg a highly regulated market uh, to ensure that the process of capital formation is done in an efficient manner, to ensure that securities and the products that are traded on the exchange are done uh, uh, in a fair and orderly manner, and that investors' interests are adequately protected. I think we, we cannot have a market if you don't protect the interests uh, uh, of investors. And then talking briefly about the role of these critical financial intermediaries, who are they? Okay, I want to invest. How do I go about it? Can I just go on my own and uh, you know, pick up GTB shares or uh, you know, like uh, uh, Tosin had mentioned, all the, all the uh, stuff that she mentioned. Um, I think the first thing you need to know is you need to go through some of these financial intermediaries. Uh, and you can go through either broker dealers, fund managers, or asset managers. And we'll talk briefly about them. So broker dealers, uh, who we call uh, dealing members of the exchange um, and otherwise known as stock broking firms. These are financial intermediaries, obviously, that engage in buying and selling of securities. They also bring uh, issuers to actually come to the market in terms of listing on the exchange. Uh, so the, the, the broker dealers would essentially onboard investors, go through the various uh, KYC channels that you, you need in terms of onboarding of customers. And also, they also play a role if you're not a sophisticated investor, if you want to be advised, they can also play that role for you because these are professionals uh, and they are highly regulated entities as well. They can actually guide you in terms of the types of 
uh, securities based on your risk appetite, based on the uh, your own appropriateness and suitability uh, of your category. So depending on your age, depending on your investment horizon and things like that, you do all that onboarding and that due diligence. And then they guide you. If you're a retiree, for example, uh, you want to be taking, uh, uh, you know, investing in low risk assets. I should also add at this point that whilst we, the focus of this conversation has heavily been on uh, equities and, and uh, stocks as it were, the exchange is actually a multi-asset class exchange. So in other words, we all actually provide uh, a number, a range of different financial products that are listed on the exchange. So for example, we have fixed income products. We also have exchange rated products as well. Uh, and of course, we are working towards uh, rolling out uh, derivative products, which we'll talk about it shortly. Now, uh, dealing with broker dealers can actually, you can, you can go through different channels in terms of they can advise you and they can, or you can, they can manage your account for you in a dis discretionary manner. If you say to them, uh, I, I would want you to use your own professional wisdom and uh, uh, knowledge to invest for me, and then they can use their own, or you can do it on your own. Um, very briefly, I'll talk about some of the technology that we've implemented over the last few years in terms of how easy it is to now do that. Uh, fund or asset managers, as they're called, are also licensed and regulated entities. Uh, in, the difference here is that these, these, these uh, intermediaries, they, pull, they tend to pull funds together from various investors and invest uh, in various securities or products known as things like mutual funds, uh, collective investment schemes. Um, some of these mutual funds are also equity funds. Some of them are money market related, uh, amongst other types of uh, uh, products. Uh, and these, um, uh, some of these mutual funds can actually be traded uh, on the exchange as well because they're listed on the exchange. Now, technology has evolved in such a way that uh, gone are days where you need to take a walk into a broker's office to go and open an account, do all the onboarding that is required with technology. And since the exchange launched uh, what we call XGen, the new trading platform in 2013, uh, that brought us in, in, in touch with the uh, 21st century. Essentially, uh, most dealing members now have uh, digital platforms, whether it's online platforms, mobile platforms, or other digital applications, where you can download an app on your phone or your, uh, your, your, your tablet, or, or computer where you can download an app or, or, or whatever, or go online, open accounts and actually start transfer money and actually start trading. I think it's, it's now done in a very seamless and easy manner. Uh, and you can actually see the market in, you know, using the broker's platform. You can see the, the way the markets are performing. You can actually start to take positions on your own. Very simple, you can buy and sell uh, given those orders. You can see what price and you can set the prices as well that you would like to buy and sell. Uh, using the broker's features. And there, there are a range of these options available to, to investors now. Now, we'll talk very, very briefly about regulation in the market. Uh, you know, I mentioned the exchange plays a role of a self-regulatory uh, organization. This is backed by uh, the Investment and Securities Act. Uh, if you look through sections 28 through to section 37, uh, the exchange itself is licensed and regulated by the APEX regulator, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and obviously we can, we have a number of roles that we perform uh, in this. So one of them would be we make rules and we also supervise uh, uh, our operators, both the issuers as well as uh, the dealing member firms. Uh, we also provide uh, uh, oversight uh, through compliance monitoring activities. We carry out enforcement and disciplinary actions where there is a breach of our rules. Um, and with the use of regulatory technology, uh, we've, we've come out with a series, an X series, where we have all types of uh, technology uh, to perform our regulatory oversight functions from what we call uh, uh, XBOS, which is the broker oversight and supervision system, uh, to X issuer, which is a system that's used for the uh, governance of, uh, issu of issuers, uh, and SMART, which is a world-class surveillance system that is uh, used in over about 60 territories globally. Uh, we, prov we provide real-time market surveillance of the market to ensure that investors' interests are adequately protected. Um, and so investor, investor protection is one of the critical functions of any exchange. Um, and we also have uh, an investor protection fund that is designed to uh, compensate uh, investors in the event that there's been some form of defalcation or insolvency of a broker. Uh, so if, if you're dealing with a broker that goes, uh, uh, that defaults and it becomes insolvent or has been involved in defalcation, uh, which is mis misappropriation, another word for using uh, misappropriation. Essentially, you may be eligible to get some compensation uh, under the investor protection fund. 
And then we also have a very robust complaint management and dispute resolution process, which basically means that in the event that you're un unhappy or unsatisfied with one of the, uh, maybe the services that have been provided, uh, then you can reach out through that framework uh, to uh, the exchange or to the broker in the first instance. And then you will get your, 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 your complaint dealt with very, very quickly uh, and hopefully to your satisfaction. Essentially, it's designed to protect, like I said, the interests of, of, of investors. Okay, so um, we've had to move very quickly, but some of the critical points that we will want to leave you with uh, on this is uh, the exchange. Uh, Tosin had mentioned the fact that the exchange has a very robust website with a ton of information. And some of these links that we felt will, will be very useful for this conversation uh, and to leave you obviously to go and do some further uh, uh, research on your own is number one, how do I become an investor? What, what, what are the practical guys that I need um, in terms of doing this? There's a very robust pack on the NSC website and this link here that shows you the stages. One, uh, you know, how to contact a broker, how you can start and all of those things. The other important point to leave you with is the, look, the directory of dealing members of the exchange. So I don't know a broker, I don't know where to find them. We actually have a robust uh, a list. We update this list uh, uh, on a regular basis. It basically has a list of all the dealing members on the exchange, how to contact them, their address uh, and contact details amongst other things. We've gone a bit further into providing some of our compliance uh, type data. So one for brokers and two for uh, companies themselves. So the first report is called the Broker Tracks Report. Uh, this is one of the transparency initiatives of the exchange. So essentially what this is designed to do is it keeps investors informed of the compliance history of dealing members on a regular basis, okay? It's a compilation of various compliance reports uh, which are updated and published on the NSC website. Uh, so if you're looking for a broker and you want to do some sort of due diligence on them to see how well they are performing their own duties on the exchange, then you can look at the broker tracks report on the NSC website. The link is, is there for you to look at it. And then you've also got the ex-compliance uh, report, which basically is a a similar report, but for now the, is the issuers, the companies that are listed on the exchange. Uh, the report is designed obviously to maintain market integrity. Uh, it provides um, uh, a range of compliance related information of all listed companies and it's updated on a regular basis as well. So I hope that uh, uh, we're better informed now, one, about the role of the, the stock exchange, uh, both from the, 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 the perspective of providing a platform for listing uh, securities, the platform for trading those securities, uh, as well as providing the safety nets and uh, the investor protection uh, capabilities of the ex for the exchange and for investors. Um, so, with that said, uh, I will thank I thank you for listening. Uh, I will take questions and comments uh, uh, at the end of the uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ikechi. Thank you, Mr. Shubanjo. There's, uh, there's no better person to talk to us about the role of stock exchanges and financial intermediaries in the stock markets than the head of the broker dealer regulation at the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Uh, once again, that was Mr. Femi Shubanjo. Thank you very much for that uh, insightful presentation. Um, for the benefit of those that may have joined late, uh, let me just say once again that if you have any questions for Mr. Shubanjo, um, for any other speaker that we have here today, you can type them in the public chat space or in the Q&A section at any point during this event. And then asking your question, please remember to include your name, your location, and indicate who your question is directed at. Um, we're going to move on to the second attendee poll. Uh, before then, we'll display the results from the first one very quickly. And then we will move on to the second one. Um, this second one is going to be slightly shorter than the first. We'll have just three minutes for this one. So um, I'd just like to ask once again that we all take a minute to answer them before we move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, as with the first poll, the results will be displayed for everyone to see as we go along with the webinar. So please go ahead and uh, answer the poll questions. Thanks.
Thank you. I can see the answers are coming in. Please keep uh, keep the answers coming in. Um, we're definitely going to display these at the end of this uh, session. Once again, we still have a lot of questions coming in and people are asking for the presentation slides. You will get the presentation slides, we will email them to you and we will send you a link to the recording of this webinar so that you can also watch that in your own at your own time. Um, as we go on, we will display the results of this poll. So please respond. We have a 56%, 57% participation. I'd like to ask for those that haven't, uh, for those that are not are not participating, please go ahead and answer. This is going to help us to know to present this better in future and also to help us to know your expectations from this webinar. So we have about a minute and a half left for this poll. So please go ahead and answer. We have a minute more for this poll. Um, please go ahead, keep answering the questions. We appreciate your feedback. Um, thank you as you do so. Um, we're gonna start collating this at the end of this, at the end of this session and display the results to you almost immediately. So please go ahead and answer the questions. If you haven't answered, we would really appreciate your feedback on this. Thank you. We have 15 seconds more. We still have about 75% participation in the polls. Um, for the last uh, few seconds, if you haven't responded, please go ahead and respond it. Um, this is going to stop in about three, two, one, and the poll is over. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, the results are being analyzed and we will share them with you in due course. So thank you very much for, for participating in that. Um, we're going to move on. Uh, our, our first two presentations have set the tone for the next item on our agenda. And I'm sure that a, a lot of us have been looking forward to this. Uh, I, for one, definitely have been looking forward to this. Uh, this is an interview with an investment professional. Our investment professional today is Wale Olusi, and he is the head of research at United Capital Securities Limited. And to interview Wale, please allow me to reintroduce the CEO of Money Africa, Lua Tosin Lasende. Over to you, Tosin and Wale. Hi, Wale. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Good afternoon, Tosin. Good I'm afternoon, great, everyone great as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like your background. Is that is that a bulb? It looks nice. Okay, it, great. It, Go it, ahead. It's a light bulb. Yeah, it's a light oh, bulb. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I love the concept. All right. So I was having a chat with Wale earlier on in the week and we're just talking about, you know, what it is like to be an investor amongst others. So Wale, I'm just going to jump right into my very first question. When did you start investing? Okay. So I started investing um, about 15 years ago, just before the market crashed in, in, in 2007, 2008. You know, I was very, very interested and, you know, that was when I started interested. I think I was, you know, much, definitely much younger than this. <laughs> fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So how did you actually get started with investing? What prompted your thoughts? How did you go about it? Just talk us through it. Okay, so for me, you know, what, what prompted it was, um, I, I, I used to read a lot of, you know, motivational books. And one of the names that comes up all the time is this guy, Warren Buffett, you know, who seems like the god of investment. He's made so much money. Investing, I started so young. So I wanted to know, you know, how to make money with stocks. So I got interested. I started reading books about investment. And when I was doing internship back then, you know, uh, while in school, you know, I picked a, an investment bank, you know, so they sell stocks and stuff. And, you know, that was the first, um, you know, you know, entry to stock investing for me. Okay. 
Fantastic, fantastic. So how were you able to develop yourself from being a novice to a seasoned investor? I knew that you already spoke about, you know, there was Warren Buffett, but if we're being honest, this thing requires deliberate effort. So can you just share any of that with me? How did you transition from being a novice to actually a seasoned investor? So I'm going to say that, you know, even though I started because of the interest in, you know, reading about Warren Buffett and so on, you know, my movement from being a novice to, you know, obviously, you know, head of research. Now I actually advise people who have billions of Naira or dollars, you know, to invest right now was I realized that for you to be able to do this successfully, there's a lot of, lot of knowledge that you need. So I had to go back to school and pick up interest in finance, in economics, in, you know, global um, finance as well. I took the CIS as well, you know, uh, you know, at some point I, you know, was even awarded one of the best students in CIS. CIS is Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers here in Nigeria, because I wanted to know what is the meaning of all of this PE ratio. I mean, how do I make sense of everything and, you know, I'll be able to make money. So the truth was actually that even though I started then, 06, 07, 08, I didn't make real money until you know, after I actually really understand the market, that, that took about 10 years, you know, wow. um, you know, I knew the nitty gritty. I finished from school, joined a new investment bank as a research analyst, you know, um, I, I even took the CFA at some point, and then I was confident enough to now go in, you know, with, you know, a huge sum of money so that, you know, right. I could yes. come out without being, you know, uh, without being caught in the fire because it's a very volatile market and it's not for the faint hearted. And for you to know, for you to be able to make real money there, you need to have the investment education. And I think that's something that's lacking. Uh, I, I like the poll that I see, sorry, I like the poll that I see a lot of millennials who in their mid thirties, early twenties are here. But I think maybe on behalf of the NSC, we probably need to conduct, you know, this kind of training but those that are missing completely, zero to 17 years of age in the poll I saw, none of them are here. And we need to get them started at that Thank very you. age. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, that's really nice. And I'm very happy that, I mean, the NSC now has a very robust system. And the beautiful thing is this, you know, somebody said something once that people don't have to make the same mistake you made, right? right. So for a lot of us starting out then, it was try and error, you know, Sometimes I remember back then I would even go on like some Niger something websites to just be reading up things and they've bridged that gap. They've helped them to save time. So now the NSC has a more robust system. It saves them time. They don't have to make the same mistakes we made then and they can just really learn. Great. I'm happy about that. So the next question for today is basically asking you that, you know, what is your personal investment strategy? So what is Wale's investment strategy? I'd like to hear of this. Okay, thank you. And I would like to answer this question by first of all saying, you know, your presentation earlier, I listened, you know, into it. That was a great presentation. You know, you. you mentioned that, you know, what you like is capital appreciation. And, you know, that's fine. And you also mentioned that a lot of young people, a lot of millennials like that. They are not a dividend investor like you know, the older generation. Yeah, the older but for generation. me, I think I'm a little bit of a fundamentalist, meaning that, you know, I look at the value that the company can give me and invest for that rather than just, of course, ultimately it's capital appreciation is the income, both the dividend and the capital appreciation. And by that, what I mean is, you know, reviewing all the companies, which company are actually, you know, very good companies. You showed us the 10 years challenge of a few companies that I like. GT, you know, a sector leader in the banking space. 2011, I, mean, I think 2010 or so, they were 11 Naira, today 33 Naira. You know, that's about three times. You showed, you showed us Nestle about 180. Today, over a thousand naira. That, that's another sector leader. So I look at companies with good, you know, profitability. You can't get it wrong. You know, because I'm an investment analyst and a head of research, I'll give you an example. A client called me, you know, earlier in the week, I think last week, late last week, that, oh, Wally, uh, I need money urgently. I want to sell my Zenith. But I bought it at um, about 24. Now it's around 23. I think as I've lost a lot of money. What I wanted to do, you know, with the money, it won't be enough again. Then I'm like, please, sir, hold on, hold on. You haven't lost money. 
Zenit gives you a dividend yield of about 11 to 12 percent if you had bought at 24. So there's no way you have lost money. It's just that you are not accounting for the dividend income which you have collected. He said, yes, I've collected in the soup, sir. You haven't lost money. So you can go ahead and sell your Zenit at 23 if you really urgently need the money. If you net out the dividend, you probably have made you know, some percentage on it. But if you wait a bit, you've made money. So I think I'm a little bit of fundamentalist because over a long period of time, if you buy good companies with good management, good profitability or profit margins, they keep growing their revenues, you can't get it wrong. You keep getting your dividend every year and you get a, a capital appreciation. I'd like to say finally that stock market is a long-term investment. It's not, you, I mean, people speculate. I speculate at times. I mean, I do short-term trading. At times I even do it in one day. You, the market is low for a particular price. You come in before the end of the trade. That's not 10%. You come out, there's nothing you're waiting for, you know. But on a whole, long-term, you know, if I have some DT at 20 Naira, you know, when I came in initially and the market crashed in March 2020 because of COVID, it came to 16. Wow, that's an opportunity to buy more of DT because I'll just increase, you know, my own piece of the cake, like you told us earlier, so that I can earn more dividend and more capital appreciation because long term, GT is a 30 Naira stock, like, you know, we've seen so far in the year. Fantastic. So let's just make an example of what you've told us. Number one, you're a fundamental analyst, meaning that you're able to read the financial statement. You know, earlier on in the class, we we're talking about an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow. Every investor should be able to, at the very minimum, just understand what it means and how it goes. Number two, you spoke about management. So basically, who are the people behind the company? Have you done right. your research? You know, look up on management team. Management is, is very, because you invest first, and the people before you invest in the company. So the people are actually very important. Absolutely. Then you said something again about long-term, right? So it's a better strategy. You're looking at it on average. So it's not something you want to quickly jump in or jump out. And last but not the least, talking about capital appreciation, you also don't want a situation where as we're not taking account of the dividend. Because the truth is, if you look at the exchange, a lot of the companies that actually give you capital appreciation, they also give dividend. So that way we're able to capture both. So you are telling a complete story. So I really, really love your, your strategy. It's a very That's brilliant, a brilliant summary. <laughs> no, I love your strategy. Well done, Wally. You're doing a great job. So now, how has it changed over the years? What changed? Okay, you mean for the market or for me? Sorry. No, 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 I'm talking about your strategy. How did you change over the years? How did you arrive here? Oh, well, I mean, I think what I've realized is a good company is always a buy. I mean, one of, one of, one of the job I do is to make recommendations to investors. Is it a buy, is it a sell or a hold? What I've realized is that a good company is always a buy. So, you know, what has changed is understanding that if you are investing long-term, and that's a good company. There's no point. Of course, you can take you can take um, um, occasional profit. For example, you bought it at twenty, GTS or Zenit or you know UBA or United Capital. I work with United Capital. We're five naira or four naira fifty cobra at the moment. At the peak of this pandemic, it was two naira. You know, if I've made hundred percent on a United Capital, for example, or more, I could take profits today. But I can come back once I see that that price dropped a particular level again. I think what has changed is understanding that, you know, this market, you know, is a volatile market. It goes up and down depending on the news. On Monday, or I think last week, when, you know, there was an NTB auction by Central Bank that uh, says yield on 364 day bill went from 0.15% to 3.2%. People sold off. I told them not to panic. But today, the market was up again. Why? Because there's a World Bank you know, headline that says that they've granted a particular dollar loan to Nigeria. That's the positive news. So it's just life. Yeah. Good yeah. things happen all the time. Bad things happen all the time. So don't panic. Understand that the market is up and down. And you know, buy when the market is low, when people want to sell, when everybody is excited and sell I mean, sell when everybody's excited, buy when everybody's afraid. I think that's a overall principle that should guide you. Great stuff. So quick recap, bet on your winners. If there's a winner, keep betting on your winners. 
Also, learn how to manage your emotions when investing. There'll be good days and there'll be bad days. Last question, Wale. With the technology impacting every industry, including investing, I mean, we've seen a lot of tech apps now, you know, coming up and cropping up in that space. What do you see as the future of investing? What's the next hot thing? I mean, how do you think technology is going to like shape that space? What do you think? Well, I think um, technology is threatening even our job as brokers because today, for example, for us here at United Capital, we have a mobile app, investnow, you know, .ng, that you can actually use to trade by yourself within the comfort of your home on your mobile phone, you know, and a lot of other companies are doing that. If you go to Afriinvest or Stambik, or most of them have their mobile app. You can as well trade international stocks. You know, I see a, lot, a number of them even in Nigeria. And, you know, we know, you know, their names. So I think the future looks like this thing is going to be so globalized that, you know, with all these apps, you can actually trade any stock. If you don't want to trade Nigerian stock, you can trade US stocks, other African stocks, you know, you know, with technology, there's actually no boundary anymore. And, you know, it just depend on your investment, you know, knowledge. And with what we've seen in the economy, there's, there's a little bit of increased interest in seeing how the rest of the world looks like so that you can preserve your capital, especially because of, you know, um, the realities of the exchange rate. So, you know, people want to invest in Nigeria because the return is, you know, really high. People, some people also want to invest in the rest of the world and with technology, um, I think you can do that. Fantastic, that's a fantastic one. Quick recap, you're looking at a global future, knowing that there are no boundaries, people can actually move out, whilst the people can also move in. And also you're looking at the products in the hands of more people, right? So that way, you know, like we said earlier, Chukuma, Zena, with a 55K, everybody can now have a product in their hands. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Wally, for that session. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed listening to you. And well done for the job you're doing. You're doing a great Thank job. Thank you. You're doing a great job as well. I, I also need to thank the environment of the exchange for putting this together. And of course, all the participants, I see a lot of energy, a lot of excitement in the room. And I mean, a lot of attendees here, both here and, and on LinkedIn. Thank you very much, guys. And I'm proud of you guys for the interest. All right, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Tosin and Wale, for that very engaging session, and for you know really unpacking the subject, speaking extensively, and you know providing uh, the much needed clarity on on all of the things relating to to investing. Um, before we go into the <clears throat> the question and answer session, um, we are going to display the results from the previous poll. So uh, here are the results from the second poll, which we did. So we'll just take a few seconds to look at the results of this poll before we move on. Um, while we look at the poll, please remember that you still have the opportunity to ask questions. So type your questions in the Q&A box on your screen and indicate who your question is directed at, and then go ahead and ask your questions. Also remember to include your name. Thank you. All right, so uh, I hope we've had enough time to look at the results from the poll. Thank you again, once, uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, for answering all of those questions. And now that we've seen the presentations and listened to the, to the speakers, it's time now for our question and answer session. So please go ahead and answer your and ask your questions and indicate who your questions are directed at. We will take the questions in batches of three, and then we will give the speakers a chance to answer the questions before we move on to the next batch of questions. So um, I can already see some questions coming in. Uh, for those questions where it was not, um, th there was no uh, person who it was directed to, I will just uh, direct them to whoever I think is best suited for answering the questions. Uh, let me announce at this point that with us here today is the head of retail investor coverage at the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Um, her name is Chidema Chikweke Okolo. And uh, I see some questions here, which I think that she is in a very good position to answer. Um, so I'm going to direct a couple of questions towards her right now. Um, Chidima, if you're here with us, I have two questions here, which will come to you. I'll take three questions and then uh, uh, we'll give you a chance to answer those ones. The first one is from Angela Lua Uliole, and she says, please, how can I get more knowledge about the stock market? 
That's from Angela Uliole. Uh, the second question is from Mudupe Onitilo, and she says, how can I buy stock on my own without going through a stock broker? How can I buy stock on my own without going through a stock broker? Uh, the third question we have here is directed at uh, the head of the broker dealer regulation at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, uh, Mr. Femi Shobanjo. Uh, this one is from Emmanuel Ogebe. And he says, I have a question for Mr. Shobanjo. How can we determine if the financial data released by companies is actually authentic? So this is our first batch of questions. I will give uh, the head of retail investor coverage and health of broker dealer regulations a chance to answer before we go on to the next batch of questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ikechi. Um, so to answer the first question, how to get more information about the stock market. Um, there are two main, uh, there are three main ways in which you can get more information. Um, number one, the NSE provides a lot of information through their website. Um, if you go into the NSE website, the tab called investing, it gives you information on how to invest um, these product, the securities and the products that are available to invest and also information on the um, issuers, the stock, information on the brokers. So a lot of information is actually disseminated through the Nigerian Stock Exchange uh, website. Otherwise, you can actually go through your broker. Your broker should be able to give you a lot of information, just like Twain, Tosin had mentioned in her presentation. You can go to your broker, your financial advisor to get information on how to invest in the stock market. Um, on the second question, you are asking, how can I invest through without going through a stock broker? Well, the way the market is configured in Nigeria, you have to go through a stock through a stock broker to access the market. Now, there are various ways in which you can actually access the stock market through your stock broker. Most stock brokers now have online platforms and even mobile apps. So you don't need to you know, be in direct contact with the stock broker at all times. Once you sign up, you go through your KYC, you get your account, you can actually go on their online platforms or their mobile apps and see the market directly and make your investment decisions yourself and execute yourself. So the exchange allows for direct market access for investors through their stock brokers. So if you get in touch with your stock broker, if you don't have a stock broker, if you go to the NSC website, there are a list of stock brokers. So you can go to their websites, research them, find out which stock broker you're comfortable with. Do they have all the things that you need? For example, a mobile app or an online access, or you can even check if you don't, if you're not comfortable with online access, you can check for brokers that are close to you, where you can have direct contact with the um, broker. So there's a lot of information there. So you don't necessarily need to go to the stockbroker once you have online and direct access. Thank you. All right, thanks Chidima. I'll give uh, Mr. Shubanjo a chance to answer his question now. Okay, um, so if I got you correct, um, Ikechi, you, you mentioned um, uh, the question is around how do we know if the financial data that companies put out is authentic? And, and I think the easiest way for me to answer that question is to say, look, uh, what is clear is that companies that are uh, listed or quoted companies tend to have uh, a higher standard of uh, regulation, a higher standard of governance, uh, higher level of higher degree of transparency, uh, amongst others. Uh, also to add that a lot of the companies that are listed also have primary regulators. So if you look at banks, for example, uh, they would report to the central bank, if you look at insurance companies reporting into NICOM, uh, amongst others like that, looking at the various sectors. So the likelihood is that uh, the data that the companies will put out would have gone through a high level of scrutiny, whether from a governance, corporate governance perspective, uh, amongst others. Uh, and so you will find that it's more credible than the companies that are not actually uh, uh, listed. I think, I think some data has been proven to show that. Um, however, having said that, it's not to say that it's impossible uh, that you might find companies uh, putting out uh, data that's not uh, uh, in order. Uh, but I think the exchange, uh, you know, for the way the manner that we regulate companies is one of disclosure. So companies are required to disclose as much as possible. So whenever there's any material event that goes on in the, you know, in the company's uh, life, it's supposed to disclose to investors. Uh, and I think that over time, we found that uh, there's some le a high level of credibility in the financial data that our listed companies put out in the market. Thank you. 
Thank you for those answers. Uh, uh, we're going to move on to the next batch of questions. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Shubhendra to please hold on. I have a question here for him as well. I have a question for Tosin and I have a question for Wally. I'll take the question from for Mr. Shubhendra first. It says, this is from Ugochuku Uwebu, and he says to, to Mr. Shubhendra, please, what is the NSC's rule of standing on insider trading? Um, the other questions are directed at uh, the other one. I'm going to direct this to Wale. It doesn't indicate who it's for, but I'll direct this to Wale. Uh, it's from God's Will Okorie. And he says, how does insurgency affect stock prices? And then the last question for this batch is from Belema Okorika. And she says, I would like to seem to shed light on how to identify viable stocks to invest in considering that some companies' financial information may not give a true picture of the real state of the company. So, um, Mr. Shubhanjo, please go ahead and answer the, the questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you. Um, so, what's the exchange's rule of position on insider uh, dealing or insider trading, as it were? I think the exchange takes a very firm uh, uh, position against <laughs> insider trading, and I think uh, it's, it's important to understand uh, the definition of what actually insider trading. The exchange has rules around insider trading. Uh, I think um, uh, the Investment and Securities Act also uh, contains rules around it. So essentially it's around when you're uh, dealing in um, uh, information that is uh, not public, it's price sensitive and it's material. Uh, so there are a number of factors that have to be met. Of course, we know that, so the, the first starting point is that there are rules that prohibit insider dealing in the market. Uh, the second point is around how do you, uh, uh, you know, enforce those rules? And, and I think that's where the issue is. So it's insider dealing is one of those situations where uh, it's very difficult to investigate and to prove. So you can, you can investigate, you can have a finding for insider dealing, but proving it, uh, you know, is incredibly difficult. Uh, in, in some other jurisdictions like the U.S., for example, we, we, we studied the, the way the U.S. market works. On average, it takes about six months to investigate, just to investigate a case of insider dealing. And um, obviously prosecuting it is, is also difficult. Uh, we're still looking. I mean, uh, we have a lot of disclosure rules around uh, insider dealing. So for every uh, trade that uh, insiders do in the market, companies are supposed to disclose uh, to the exchange. Uh, you also have, uh, uh, you know, emphasis on brokers that actually trade to also make some, some of those disclosures as well to the exchange. So the exchange is doing a lot of around this space. Uh, and of course, in the event that we're able to uh, uh, make a finding for insider dealing, then it will be widely communicated to the, to the market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the questions for Wale and Tosin, please go ahead, Wale, and then Tosin can answer us before we move to the other batch of questions. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> I think the question for me was, uh, how does insecurity affect stock trading? Am I correct, AKG? Yes, the word is insurgency, but I guess the idea is the same. How does insurgency affect stock prices? Okay, so, I mean, see, the truth is, stock investors are very, you know, they, are, they, they could be very savvy to the extent that they dissect issues. They don't, people don't just sell off stocks because there's insurgency in Nigeria. They try to dimension it. Where is the insurgency? Far north, in the northeastern part of Nigeria. Does it affect the banks? No, so no problem. Does it affect an Greek company located somewhere in the northeast? You know, yes. Then that's negative for that particular company. But most of the time, except it has, you know, a strong impact on the macroeconomic dynamics of Nigeria as a company. And you now have a lot of foreign portfolio investors in Nigeria. I mean, foreign investors now in Nigeria who may want to sell off and exit as a result of that. It doesn't directly have that impact if it doesn't affect that company directly. So at times, you know, some issues are looked at from a broad macro point of view. But most of the time, investors tend to look at it from a particular um, you know, company point of view. So like... And Tosi mentioned earlier, some macro issues that affect everybody. I don't think insurgency is one of them, although it could be if it affects the Nigerian macro as a whole, but where it doesn't, uh, you know, so, I mean, it depends. I don't know if that helps the person. 
Thank you. Thank you, Wally. Um, Tosin, your question, please go ahead. All right, great. <clears throat> so the question you asked is also coincides with one of the summaries I did with Wale during his session. Basically what to look out for when you're choosing a great company. Number one, fundamental analysis, like we already spoke about. Look at the companies, the companies, look at the company's financial statement. That is like the lifeblood of the company. What, knowing how it ticks, knowing what happens to it. And the truth is, if the financial statement is not telling you that story, Maybe you have to have maybe some spiritual powers or something to find out. And that's really just the truth. If they deliberately conceal or hide some information that you cannot see from the financial statement, um, it's very hard to pick it up. So we go, we always go with the financial statement. What are the numbers saying? What have they said over the years compared to the other industry as well? So for instance, if you're looking at a sector player, you're looking at the financial services sector, you're looking at the insurance sector, you're looking at the FMCG sector, you compare it to the other players in that sector. Number two, management. So are the people back in the company is very, very important that we know those back in it. Number three, right? So we've spoken about the, the financial statement that is fundamental analysis. We've spoken about the management. Number three then is deciding what do I do in terms of managing my own risk? How much of, a, of risk do I want to take? Why am I investing? Am I looking at a dividend? Am I looking at capital appreciation? And then just to put all of that together and then you'll be able to make a decision. So do not overthink it. You know, like we said, there are so many resources online at the NSS website and even with your stockbrokers. Just start taking that step. That fight the fear and actually take the step. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tosin. Thank you, Wale, and uh, thank you, Mr. Shabanjo. Um, we're just going to take a couple of more questions uh, because of time. Uh, this question is directed at Tosin. It says, please, it's from Simi Esa, and the person says, I'd like to know the best time to invest. Is it when the prices are low or is there something to look out for or is there something to look out for before jumping on the train? And this other one is also for Tosin. It says, please, at what point is from Sufyan Faladi. And it says, please, at what point could one stop investing when you notice a, perpe a perpetual nosedive in an investment which one had hoped would appreciate, but disappointedly, disappointedly did otherwise? The question is for Tosin. So please go ahead and answer the two questions. Okay, great. So when is the best time to start? We always preach that don't time the market. So basically cost averaging does it in such a way that you actually invest on a regular basis. So when you have a high, when you have a medium, when you have a low, what actually happens is that you average your cost over time. We like to use a scenario. In January, there was a particular company that the shares was going for um, 20 Naira. Then in February, it went to 15 Naira. Then in March, it went to 10 Naira. Now, what has happened there is that even though the price kept dropping, if you continue to buy the same unit on a monthly basis, just doing your cost averaging, your average price would have been 15 Naira. So instead of looking like, hey, God, when can I buy it at 10 Naira? Or hey, God, when will I get it at 20 Naira? With cost averaging, you always get the best deal because you really don't know when you get the lowest price. So when we cost average, we can then look at how it balances itself out. So like we always say, is it a good company? Um, does it have right management? Then I can steadily cost average so that even when it has a high or when it has a low, it averages itself and I have a fair return. So that's what we always preach. So um, I, think that's the, I think that's the answer to the question. Is there any other question I'm missing? Okay, all right, over to you. Yes, uh, Tosin, you have one more question. The other question for you is, when is the right time to sell off my stocks? Or um, uh, when is the right time to sell off my stocks? It says, my apologies, okay. what, what, what point can I stop, stop investigating when you notice a perpetual, a perpetual nosedive in an investment? I think what he means to say is, when is the right time to sell off? That's a perpetual, notice a perpetual nosedive in an investment which one had hoped would appreciate, but disappointedly, did otherwise. Please All right, great. Okay, so in terms of best time to sell off, we always ask what's your strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, somebody can say, oh, I'm coming into the market and my aim is to make a 25% return. And after that, I want to sell that share. Once you hit your target, please go ahead and sell because you set the limits for yourself. Another person will say that, oh, I'm a long-term investor and I want to hold this for three years. Go ahead and hold this for the period of time. So whenever you sell, depends on your strategy. Some people are short-term traders. They go in, they go out, they go in, they go out. That's their strategy. So you need to find what your strategy is and then you'll be able to do it according to those terms. So that's basically how 
when should I sell? When should I buy? There are other also comprehensive advice out there. Some people will say, oh, you know, when the market is doing this, when it's doing this, when it's doing that. But we usually speak with retail investors looking at long-term players. We always say, set a target, set a goal, or you can average it over the long term. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tosin, for those answers. Thank you, everyone, um, for your questions and to the rest of our speakers for their answers. Unfortunately, for time, uh, we can't go ahead with any more questions, but we are going to answer all the questions and send them to you later. Um, for now, I would like to call on the head of the Retail Investor Coverage Department at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, uh, Mrs. Chidema Chikweke Okolo, to deliver the vote of thanks. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kechi. Um, to the CEO of Nigerian Stock Exchange, our speakers today, Femi Shobanjo, Tosin Olasinde, Wale Olushi, distinguished ladies and gentlemen who have joined us across all our online channels. It's indeed an honor to deliver the vote of thanks to close out this stimulating and interactive webinar on understanding investing in the, in the stock market, which you all agree has been tremendous. At the Nigerian Stock Exchange, we recognize that it's important that investors receive adequate knowledge of how the stock market works and how to take advantage of the opportunities it presents. And I believe we have achieved this today. Let me express our deepest appreciation to all the speakers who have shared their knowledge and experience with us on this webinar. Your contributions are very in insightful and will inspire further discourse and engagement on smart investing in the Nigerian capital market. I'm proud to say that this webinar has been an outstanding one, both in participation and in the quality of conversations we have had. An event of this nature is made possible through the contributions and commitments of the esteemed participants, organizers, and speakers. I would therefore like to commend the roles played by Money Africa and, Capital, and United Capital Securities. The success of this event attests to the resilience of both teams. I would also like to thank my colleagues in the Retail Investor Coverage Department for putting this event together. Femi Shumbanja for his, for his presentation and an IT and corporate communications teams for their roles in making this webinar a success. More importantly, perhaps the greatest gratitude goes to the audience who have joined us across various online platforms. We appreciate your time and we do not take this for granted. For all the questions we are not, we're not able to answer for want of time, we will surely respond via email. And if you have any press questions, please send an email to the email address displayed on your screen now and we will get back to you. I thank you all for listening and please continue to stay safe and in good health. Thank you very much. Thank you Chidima for officially bringing this event to a close. Um, thank you everyone for your time and for being a part of this webinar. Do continue to stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week. Good night.